Buenas tardes. Bienvenidos a UCEA. Bienvenidos a Minneapolis. And more importantly, bienvenidos to our first General Mitz-Typher Lecture General Session. Packed house. Love it. My name is Monica Birne Jimenez. I'm the executive director of UCEA. I'm proud to be welcoming you to this gathering of family and love and research and scholarship and laughter and all the things that make you bring this energy into this room today. So welcome, welcome. I hope you've been having a good experience so far. Minneapolis has been cooperating with the weather. Um, so if and when you can, make sure you take some time to go outside and appreciate it. Our headquarters are housed in Michigan State University in the College of Education, East Lansing, Michigan. Go green. <laughs> I'm starting already. Um, and it is my pleasure to welcome our Dean, Gerlando Jackson, who has been gracious enough to come and welcome you all. Let me tell you a little bit about our dean. I keep thinking of him as our new dean, but he's in his second year now, and so, um, which I guess might still be like new in dean years. I don't know. Um, but Gerlando Jackson, and I guess I said, is the dean of Michigan State University College of Education, and he is the MSU Research Foundation Professor of Education at Michigan State. Fueled by more than 125 publications, Professor Jackson's research on hiring practices, career mobility, workforce diversity, workplace discrimination has involved to a singular focus on organizational disparities. It is a term he is credited with coining. He has authored or edited six books under I'm not, I'm, there's a long list of books. Um, he has established multiple groundbreaking initiatives that include serving as founding executive director of the Center for African American Research and Policy in 2005, founding co-director of the Asa G. Hilliard III and Barbara S. Sizemore Research Course on African American and Education held at the American Educational Research Association since 2007 founding director of Wisconsin's Equity and Inclusion Laboratory in 2010, and co-founder of the International Colloquium on Black Males in Education in 2011. You can see why we're so happy to have him at MSU. He has also received external funding to develop the Beyond the Game program and the National Study of Intercollegiate Athletics transformational projects related to the experiences of student athlete and staff in intercollegiate athletics. The recipient of more than 20 honors and awards, Professor Jackson has awarded the Mildred Garcia Senior Exemplary Scholarship Award from the Association for the Study of Higher Education, Alumni Achievement Award from the College of Human Sciences at Iowa State, Distinguished Scholar Award from the Committee on Scholars of Color at AERA, and the Brown Award for Excellence in Higher Education and Community Service from the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute. He was named to Education Week's 200 Most Influential Educational Scholar List in 2019 and 2021, Diverse Issues in Higher Education's list of nine distinguished educators that are making a mark, and Madison 365's Black Power List, both in 2018. It's my deep pleasure to welcome Dr. Gerlando Dean Jackson. Good afternoon. It is with immense pleasure and anticipation that I extend a warm welcome to each of you at the Mistifer Lecture, a highlight of the 20. 23 Annual Convention for the University Council for Educational Administration. This year, the convention theme boldly declares a call to action, imagining a hard reset in educational leadership. And we are honored to have the insightful and esteemed Dr. Gloria Lassen Billing as our distinguished lecturer. The Mr. Lectures holds a special place for this convention. 
representing a moment of intellectual inspiration and a call to action for educators, administrators, and leaders in the field of educational administration. This year's lecture promises to be especially transformative as we engage with the powerful theme, are you one of them ones leading the educational reset? Dr. Gloria Latson Billings, a trailblazer in critical education theory, multicultural education, and a transformative leadership space is uniquely positioned to guide us through a critical reflection and actionable insights needed to navigate the complexities of educational leadership in these transformative times. Her pioneering work challenges us to consider not just the educational leadership, what it is, but what it can be and what it should be, and particularly in the context of a hard reset. As we listen to Dr. Lassen Billings' lecture, I encourage each of you to be present, to be open to the transformative ideas and spirit, and to consider how you, as an educational leader, can play a pivotal role in this hard reset. This is not just a lecture, it is also a call to action and an opportunity for each of us to reflect on our roles and respective responsibilities in shaping the future of education. In the spirit of collaboration and shared commitment, let us embrace the challenge to be set forth by Dr. Gloria Lassen Billings. Let us ask ourselves, are we one of them ones, those dedicated leaders who are prepared to lead in a time of change and challenge and who are ready to reimagine and redefine the landscape of educational leadership. As we embark on this intellectual journey, I extend my deepest gratitude to my former and still ongoing colleague, Dr. Latson Billings, for sharing her wisdom, experience, and vision with us. Her contributions has indelibly shaped the landscape of education, and we are honored to have her guide us through this critical conversation. Without further ado, I will say thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you, Dr. Jackson. I feel like he did my job, and I'm still going to do it again anyway. <laughs> Welcome all to the Ms. Cipher lecture, and thank you so much for coming out in full force in support of our mission and our theme this year, and also our special guest, Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings, our Ms. Cipher lecturer for this year's UCEA convention. Although Dr. Ladson Billings is no stranger to UCEA, as she did this lecture a few years back for us, um, nor is she a stranger to the field of education, I would like to take this opportunity to share who she is a bit more to those who are less familiar. Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings is a professor for the people. She has a way of using her work to confront and simplify wicked and complex problems in education by proposing solutions and frameworks through interdisciplinary lenses and frameworks. She works clearly works for the children, as her work is ultimately for their good. She's also a teacher's professor, as she has instructed teachers over the years as to how to effectively teach and reach all children, particularly children of color. And she's a professor's professor. She has mentored hundreds of students and modeled high quality scholarship for the rest of us throughout her career. Dr. Latson Billings retired as the Keller Family Professor of Urban Education in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. 
A pedagogical theorist, her research examines social cultural issues in classrooms and teaching from a stance that recognizes the power of culture as a means for supporting the education of all children. Ladson Billings has won numerous awards for her work, of which include the ROMS Faculty Fellowship, the Spencer Postdoctoral Fellowship, and the Palmer O. Johnson Outstanding Research Award. Additionally, she has been awarded the Hilldale Award, the highest faculty honor given to a professor at the University of Wisconsin for outstanding research, teaching, and service in 2007. And she was the recipient of the 2008 Distinguished Service Award from Teachers College, Columbia University. Ladson Billings was the president of the American Education Research Association from 2005 to 2006 where she delivered the most impactful and engaging AERA presidential address in the history of the organization. She was the one who used the principles of economics to help us understand the notion of the education debt in her article, From the Achievement Gap to Education Debt, Understanding Achievement in U.S. Schools. In case you still don't know who Dr. Ladson Billings is, <laughs> she was the one who framed culturally relevant pedagogy and helped us to know that this was just good teaching. And she was the one who brought a little thing called critical race theory to the field of education. Dr. Ladson Billings has been quoted stating, a real scholar knows that his or her work will grow and change over time. This is why her work has remained relevant for decades. I challenge you to think about your own work in this light know that each of us will be known as the one who, and you have the power to fill in that blank. Today, Dr. Ladson Billings begs the question in her address to us, are you one of them ones? Are you one of them ones? And with that challenges us to be known as the ones who lead the education reset. Without further ado, I bring to you Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings. I don't know, I think if you get the standing O before you give the talk, you don't have to say anything, right? <laughs> Thank you, Lisa, for that lovely introduction and uh, Gerlando for all of your work. I'm just struggling with you in that green though, bruh. Huh. <laughs> Y'all do know we formed him, right? Wisconsin, but, and I'm just so proud of what he's doing at Michigan State, so. Uh, I had to laugh because when I was throwing stuff in the suitcase last night and my daughter looked at what I had in there, she said, you going to like a Johnny Cash concert? <laughs> I said, anybody who know me know that this is Janet Jackson. <laughs> That's who I'm channeling. I've titled my remarks for you this afternoon, Are You One of Them Ones? leading the education reset in the post-pandemic era. So let me be clear, I know the grammatical struggle some of y'all are having. <laughs> I used to teach English, okay? So I actually know that this is upsetting to some of you, <laughs> but my bilingualism goes across what you call standard or American edited English and the Gullah Geechee tradition of my father and the way we talk in the hood in West Philly. So all of that I always bring to everything I'm doing. So let me just give you a little bit of clarification so you don't start out lost. <laughs> One of them ones <laughs> from the Urban Dictionary is a person, male or female, that was born with a superior complex apart from others. Not a corny or lame person. One who stands out amongst others. The 1% of the 1% of human beings on planet Earth. Not a lame. 
And Jay-Z is one of them ones, okay? But when I thought about this particular talk, I was really harking back to my growing up in West Philadelphia. And I know that many of you in the room are too young to remember the duck and cover drills. See, in the 1950s, we were in the midst of a Cold War. And so not only did we have fire drills in school, we had atomic bomb drills. Because remember, we're coming out of World War II, and I could never figure out when the teacher would tell us, duck and cover, and we would get under these, these desks, I was always thinking, you mean to tell me this desk can save me from a nuclear bomb? <laughs> the other thing I was thinking, because the teacher never ducked and covered, was that my teacher was like Superman, right? They would not be impacted by a nuclear attack. But I like the metaphor of duck and cover because I have seen way too much of that among education leaders in this era that we find ourselves in. Instead of standing up for teachers, instead of standing against crazy legislation, instead of standing against something as simple as a book ban, many of us have decided we're gonna duck and cover. If you are ducking and covering, you're not one of them ones. <laughs> you're not one of that 1% of the 1% who is willing to stand on behalf of our young people. So I wanna start by talking about what I've called a tale of four pandemics. Now people say, wait a minute, lady. We got our hands full with one. I wanna suggest to you that there are at least four, there may be more, but the four I wanna address are, of course, the one we all know the novel coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19, that put us in such a strange place where we could not go to schools, where we were trying to do so-called remote learning, where we were asked to stand six feet away from people. We were asked to do something we should have been doing, wash your hands. I mean, y'all need a pandemic <laughs> to tell you to wash your hands. I mean, that, that part just blew me away. I'm like, you mean people not washing their hands? <laughs> but that one really brought the world to a standstill. But I want to suggest that that is not the only pandemic that our young people are dealing with today. See, they're dealing with this too. Ironic that we should be right here in Minnesota, in Minneapolis. Now, someone in here used to be a science teacher, and they're saying, woman, that is not pandemic. You know, maybe it's epidemic, but it's not pandemic. Well, can I tell you that when this incident happened, when George Floyd was murdered, who I heard from were colleagues from the UK who said, oh, you think that only happens in the US? Let us tell you about the Stephen Lawrence case. Colleagues from France texting and sending me emails saying, oh, this is not unique to the United States. Have you ever seen what we do to Francophone Africans in France, particularly if they are Muslim? Every, quote, riot that we have had has all been around this sort of race, uh, racial disparity issue. Colleagues from Canada. Y'all always wanna run up here every time you don't like who you elect. <laughs> They're like, don't come up here. Cause we're not different. We have discovered the skeletal remains of over 700 indigenous children. We're not better. Colleagues in Australia, do you see how we push indigenous people around this continent? We're not better. So yes, it is pandemic. A third pandemic is one that attaches itself to the um, COVID-19 one, and that is the economic downturn. Because you see, when COVID hit, some people lost their jobs. Some people couldn't figure out how they were gonna pay their bills, how they were gonna keep 
a roof over their heads. And one of the things we know is that we are in a globally interconnected economy. So if we don't demand goods and services on this side of the world, the people on the other side of the world don't get to make them. We still have kids who really don't know where the next meal is coming from or whether or not they'll be able to stay in their homes. And then the fourth one is one that, you know, I, I'm, I'm upset that I have to mention it because it's not a hoax. Climate change is real. The fires that swept across the West, the bad air that we experienced in the Midwest and on the East Coast this summer, they all are a result of climate change. And what I find really interesting is that this is one of the number one issues that students are concerned about. There was a study at the University of Bath that looked at 25,000 young people between the ages of 16 and 25. Their number one concern, climate change. And linked to that is the belief that the adults in the room, people like you and I, aren't going to do a darn thing about it. So those are at least four. I'm sure we could talk about issues around mental health and mental wellness. But those are four that I know our young people are dealing with. Now we have those in conjunction with what I would call a shared understanding of how black people are treated in this society. For Ralph Yarl to go pick up his baby brother and be shot in the head through a door. I mean, just don't answer the door. This young man wasn't doing anything wrong. Or for Jordan Neely, who clearly has some mental health challenges, to be taken down, strangled, and killed on a New York subway train. Now, someone might say, well, he was acting a little odd. Have you been on the New York subway? <laughs> if you ain't acting odd, you are basically a target, right? <laughs> so this notion that, oh, he, 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 he just was acting strangely. He may have been, but he didn't deserve to die. And then Tyree Nichols. And it's important for me to identify Tyree Nichols because he's killed by other black people. Those are black officers that kill him because we have a shared understanding of how black people are treated. Additionally, we are now living in a country where people think it's okay to put a buoy in international waters along with uh, barbed wire that has already killed some people. That's our reality. It does all sound of gloom and doom, and it should. But you know, I am in a faith tradition that always has hope. I always have hope. And I gather that hope around these issues from an Indian novelist by the name of Arundhati Roy. If you have not read her article, I strongly urge you to take a look at it. It's called The Pandemic is a Portal. Let me just give you a portion of it. She says that historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal. It is a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or, and don't forget that little word, or, we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. See, if you're going to be one of them ones, you're going to have to imagine a different world than the world that we are now in. And you're going to have to be a person who will fight for that different world. So, I also like the way the Pope said it. Pope said the only thing worse than this crisis is the tragedy of wasting it in the sense of failing to learn from it. 
So your conference is actually organized around a notion that I wrote in an article, oh gosh, now two years ago in Education, Equity, and Excellence, saying I'm here for the hard reset was the title of that article. See, the point of the education reset is not to go back to normal. Of course, normal is exactly where our problems were. If we go back to normal, what we are saying is the same kids who couldn't get into AP ain't getting into AP now. The same kids who are overrepresented in special education gonna continue to be overrepresented in special education. The same kids who are uh, disproportionately suspended and expelled gonna continue to be suspended and expelled. Let's not go back to normal. So what are our options? What else could we do? Well, I raised the question, is it time for a hard reset? So what does that mean? Well, I have this picture here of a device that every last one of you have somewhere in their pocket, in their, their briefcase. Even the ones of y'all who said 10 years ago, I'm not getting one of them things. <laughs> uh, you know, and I was one of them. I don't want y'all to be able to call me all the time and know where I am. But right now, they're ubiquitous. We cannot get along without them. We all have them, even in so-called developing nations. People pay their bills with it. I mean, it, it, it's the thing. I was in a rural community in South Africa. Every last kid had a cell phone, or as they say, a mobile. Oh yeah, I got a mobile, right? But I wanna use this metaphor of the heart reset because, because we all have these things and they are machines, they are devices, they don't always work the way we want them to work. When they don't work the way we want, to, want them to, we try a few things. You were like me, you try to take that little SIM card out. Okay, I blow on that, get that dust <laughs> off, it's gonna be okay. Put that SIM card in, it still don't work. Now you're gonna take out the battery. You know, maybe the battery, maybe the contacts ain't, ain't hitting right, so I'm gonna clean them up, put it back in. It still don't work. If you're ambitious, you may go online. Uh, oh, and mind you, you always do the first thing they tell you to do, just turn it off, right? Turn it off, uh, give it five minutes. And you know, you know how we do with five cell phone minutes. <laughs> but when it, the five minutes up, still, it just still doesn't work. So if you are a little bit ambitious, you might go to a support group online. And you say, anybody else have a problem? I got Samsung, Galaxy, such as I got iPhones. So and the people start putting in their stuff what they did. It'll never work. You're talking about a collection of ignorance, right? <laughs> None of this stuff them people tell you work. So you finally break down and do what you don't want to do. And you go back to your cell phone provider, whether it is the Apple store, which now you have to have an appointment. Turns out AT&T, you have to have an appointment. And it's, it's all a fiction, because my appointment was at 3 o'clock, and at 3.20, I'm still waiting for you to wait on me, right? So, but they want you to feel like they're doing business the right way. But you make your way to the cell phone provider or to your IP, your, your wireless company, and somebody who looks all of 17, <laughs> wearing a T-shirt, what happened to shirts with collars? We don't, we don't do that no more. They will ask you, can I help you? So you explain to them what is happening with your device. And then they try all the stuff you already did, right? They turn it off. Let's wait five minutes. Well, I don't want to wait five minutes with you, um, Corey. I, I, you know, I want, I want to go. But they do that. They take the SIM card out, they put that back in, they take the battery out, and then they look at you and say the following. I think it's time for a hard reset. Now, if you're like me, that's the kiss of death. Because what does that mean? For someone who doesn't back up their stuff on a regular basis, all my good food pictures is gone. 
really? All them selfies I took? Come on now. I had all the angles and everything right. Yes, all of that's going away. And they're going to give you back a device that is like it was when it left the factory. They're going to start all over again. That's my argument for what we need to do, because I don't think we'll have another opportunity, at least in our lifetime, to just start all over again. I wish I could tell you that I was smart enough to have thought about this notion of hard reset on my own, but I used to teach US history, and I always hearken back to what do we know historically? Well, there are some lessons from history. The picture on the left is a picture of post-war Japan. When the Japanese lost the war, one of the things that they decided to do differently was their education system. They didn't say, let's come back, turn to page 27 where we left off before Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They said, something we're doing is not right. One of the things they did was expand opportunities for girls. The other thing they did was look to the West, because at that time, they only had elementary and secondary schools. And they said, the West is saying there's a group in the middle. At that time, we probably called them junior high schools. Now we call them middle schools. I have a whole story about how administrators work to get rid of them ninth graders, right? It used, to be, it used to be seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. Don't nobody want them people when they build it. They really don't. So then somebody says, well, no, um, developmentally, we need to have the sixth graders in our building. So if we have six, seven, and eight, the ninth graders need to go over to the high school. And I don't know if you've ever been in a, class, in a school where the ninth graders come in. I was in a school in, in Indianapolis. And the principal said, oh, I want to show you my freshman center. I said, you done built the whole building for them? You don't want them in the building that bad that you got a whole nother building over here. But indeed, the Japanese figured out they were not serving early adolescents well. The second picture is, again, from a nation that was a loser in World War II, from Italy. That picture is from Reggio Emilia Preschool undoubtedly one of the finest preschools in the world. Uh, so special that at Wisconsin, we send early childhood candidates to Reggio Emilia so they can see what's going on. The concern that the Italians had was we're not helping our kids learn how to solve problems. We're just telling them stuff. So as you can see in this picture, the little boy is trying to um, emulate what's on the board. But the adults that are there are not hovering over him. They're allowing him to try to figure this out. So that was a hard reset for them. So someone is probably saying, yeah, but that's been, you know, 60 years ago, 70 years ago. What are you talking about? You remember Katrina? See, Katrina was an opportunity for a hard reset. There were people who said, oh, we got to get back to normal. Do you know what normal was like in New Orleans before Katrina? Poor schools, poor housing options, poor health care. So here was this little slice of opportunity to do something different. And when people are desperate for something new, they will often fall for whatever you bring, put in front of them. It's exactly what happened. The education establishment was hollering, let's get back to normal. But there were people who were with neoliberal inclinations who figured out there was actually money to be made in the public sector. And why should the public have the money when we can get the money? And so the outcome of trying something new in Katrina is not something that I would endorse at all. I am placing this here to say to you, if we don't do something new, we're going to keep seeing this happen. Anybody who is here from Texas and specifically Houston, you know what's going on. You know what's going on. Let me make a prediction, because when it happened, you're going to be able to say, that woman said that. Okay, here's the prediction. 
For those of you who don't understand how the state, the Texas Education Agency took over the Houston Independent School District, the law in Texas says if you have one school, one school in a district that is low performing three years in a row, the state may take over the whole district. Now let's think about Houston. Houston is the fourth largest district in the country, 279 schools. Only half are low performing, but they've taken over the whole district. Here's the prediction. And I will say, I can't understand how the Texas Education Agency thinks it can run schools. It can't even run the Texas Education Agency. <laughs> but here's the prediction. Those schools that were not low performing will form their own district because they are primarily in upper income, um, mostly white communities. They'll be their own district. The ones that are being taken over will be farmed out to charter school agencies, particularly the educational management organizations. I'm not talking about a community group saying, let us have our local school. I'm talking about any number of groups that decide that they know how to run your schools, even though we have data that say they don't. Look at the very first thing that has happened since the TEA took over Houston. They closed the libraries in the low performing schools. Now help me understand this. My scores are low. They're low in reading and your solution is don't give me no books? What did they decide to do? Become detention centers. Can y'all see this at all? If you're going to be one of them ones, you're going to have to say, this ain't right. You can't do this. So I don't want to just leave you with all of this sad stuff because there's plenty of it to go around. But I want to suggest to you how you become one of those ones. The first thing you have to do is lead with humility. You need to lead on the black hand side, right? <laughs> and you do that by choosing the right models. I've got four people there that most of our students don't know who they are because February will roll around and they will know Martin Luther King and they may know Harriet Tubman and Rosa Parks. But they won't know Ella Baker. They won't know Fannie Lou Hamer. They won't know September Clark. They won't know Bayard Rustin. People who are willing to be in the background. I remember seeing Fannie Lou Hamer on TV at the 1968 Democratic Convention, excuse me, 64 Convention, Atlantic City. And she said, my name is Miss Fannie Lou Hamer from Sunflower County, Mississippi. And I am the duly elected delegate for the Democratic Party. Lyndon Johnson called the networks and said, get that woman off the TV. Because they knew the power of a humble, hardworking, dedicated person could sway the nation. September Clark has always been somebody special to me. She lost her job in South Carolina because she was a member of the NAACP. School district said, if you don't quit the NAACP, we will take your license. And she turned that license over. But she also led the work at, Mount e at the Highlander Folk School in Mount Eagle, Tennessee, that helped develop Rosa Parks, that helped develop Martin Luther King. Ella Baker, when the young John Lewis and the, the youth came to her saying, they're not giving us a voice in this movement, you gotta help us. She said, I can help you, but I can't be in front because this is your movement. And Bayard Rustin, there is no march on Washington without Bayard Rustin but he was convinced that, that Martin Luther King was convinced to let him go because he was gay. But these are people who led with humility. But you also need to lead with authority and authenticity. If you're gonna be one of them ones, you gotta you got know what you're talking about, all right? So authentic leadership 
emphasizes self-awareness, personal growth, and a genuine concern for the well-being and development of others. It involves being true to oneself, displaying transparency and integrity, and fostering positive relationships with those you lead. Now, what does that look like? Well, you have to be at ease with vulnerability, okay? I'm the leader, but you know, here's where, I, where I'm, I'm struggling. But this vulnerability that you share with the folks you are leading has to be without burdening, burdening others with extensive or intimate details of their problems. Don't come and tell me all oh, your business, no. I don't want to hear that. Some of my close friends know that I was reluctantly department chair, Department of Curriculum Instruction at Wisconsin. I, I ran for 17 years. I'm like, no, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. And then I was on sabbatical in 2008, and they called me and said, you've been unanimously elected <laughs> chair of the department. Now, mind you, it's 2008. My response was, look, y'all ain't got to vote for every black person you see. But I took it, I took the responsibility seriously. And one of the things that I had to share with my colleagues, at that time I think my department had about 37 FTE. And I said I can have 37 friends or I can have 37 enemies. I can't have eight friends. Now even though I've been there 17 years and I had a closeness with some people, I'm now in a new role and I have to think about the good of the department not just my relationship with you. They also communicate their purpose and vision and remain faithful to their values. Folks who know me really well know that I've, I'm always challenged by how we chase dollars in the academy. It's like, wait a minute, that's the kind of work we're doing now? I thought you did this. Well, oh, no, there was an RFP for that. Where are your values in the middle of this? I have never applied for any grant that had the words at-risk students in it. And I'm like, I don't even know who you're talking about. I've had people call me and say, why didn't you apply for the grant? Uh, you know, it's on at-risk students. I said, I don't do work with at-risk students. Well, don't you do work with black students? Yes. Crickets, right? Because now people are feeling, oh, they have equated blackness with at-riskness. I love Margaret Beale Spencer's comment when she says, to be human is to be at risk. I didn't, you know, uh, Lisa or Jolando didn't introduce me and say she got high blood pressure, <laughs> hypertension. You know, she's suffering from irregularity. I mean, come on. <laughs> All true true but I don't want to be defined by those categories and yet we are defining kindergartners first graders as at risk and expecting them to carry that label with them for the next 12 13 years and be successful it can't happen if you're going to lead with authority and authenticity you have to build cultures of authenticity you have to be transparent and you have to have transparent and psychologically safe environments. You can't have the people you are leading be afraid to say what's on their mind. But we know that some of us are working in environments like that. Can't let him know because he's gonna just go crazy if I say this, right? And we have to seek transform transformative versus transactional relationships. Real close, real quick. Transactional, if I do this for you, what you gonna do for me? Transformative, I'm gonna do this because I think this is gonna change the whole game in here, right? So we gotta move to that notion of transformative um, relationships. You also have to lead for significance and not success. Now, this is a particular bugaboo for me. I'm telling you, everybody want to be successful. We are now in celebrity culture in the academy. Yeah. Are you yeah. kidding me? Yeah. Yeah. It's about your self-promotion? 
It's about who you going to be and what cover of what magazine you going to show up on. This is not what we signed up for. We are supposed to be working to ensure the betterment of our young people, our schools, and our society. <laughs> Celebrities are successful, but artists are significant. And so we, if you're going to be one of them ones, you're going to have to eschew the celebrity part and really work towards significance. See, managers can be successful, but directors need to be significant. When you think about the work you're doing, administrators can be successful, but leaders need to be significant. So what will your leadership legacy be? If you are leading through legacy, what is your legacy? What is it that people will say about you when you are gone? The other day I received a funeral program from a distant relative. Um, I did not go to the, the service, but her granddaughter knew that I had often sent her little notes and always sent her something at Christmas. And so she said, Grandma will want you to have this. And when I opened up the program, what was shocking to me is that in the obituary, it was a letter from her. She said, dear friends, and she began to tell you all the stuff she had done. And I'm like, I told my husband, I said, you know, I'm going to write my own too. <laughs> I ain't going to wait for y'all to try to get it right because you're going to leave out the stuff I really want people to know. But we all have legacies. And what is your legacy? Who will be here to carry on the work that you begin? There are a number of very high-profile academics. I have no clue what their legacy will be. I cannot point to one student that they mentor. Everything has been about them. And trust me, when they're gone, that's going to be gone. What will people say after you are gone? So can I leave you with a hard question? If you are leading a department, a school, a college, or a university, how would you handle the tension and the current discomfort concerning the situation in Israel and Gaza? See, we're not walled off from any of this. We are on campuses where students are embroiled in debate and also um, just anger. We have students who are afraid. I talked to a, a woman at the National Academy of Education who was a staff person, and she just in tears because her son who is Jewish, goes to Cornell. She said he's scared to leave his room. So what's going on in the leadership to allow these people to feel better and to be able to process what they're going through? Are we reactive? We wait till they all out there yelling at each other and throwing stuff and, you know, writing anti-Semitic and anti-Palestinian stuff, that anti-Islamic stuff everywhere? Now we're going to do something? We're going to react? Are we responsive? Will the students come to you and say, you know, I feel unsafe. I'm very worried about this. I can't even concentrate on the work that you are assigning because I'm really, you know, I'm really concerned about, you know, I can't turn the TV on because children are dying. I see it. Or are you proactive? This stuff started to happen. And we as adults kind of just sat there. We should have known that our young people would be troubled by all of this. I close with a tribute to scholars, some scholars who inspired me. Sylvia Winter, who is 95 years old and still has more knowledge in her pinky finger than I will ever have. Wade Boykin, 
Wade is ill, very ill right now, and I would just ask whatever your tradition is that you would hold him in your heart. But Wade was one of the first people that I ever read that said, you know, black people have some, something to contribute. This is not just about fixing them. They have a way to help fix everything. And then finally, Asa G. Hilliard III, who just had such a deep love for us as a people, but never excluded anybody else because of his love for black people. I want everyone in this room to be one of them ones, because it's time for a reset. Thank you. I am actually unusually early, <laughs> so I think we might have about five or ten minutes if there are questions that people want to raise before they head off to their next session. Yes, Profe, thank you. Uh huh. So one of the things, that, thank you for the question, uh, first of all, but one of the things that I think is important for us to understand, we actually did learn some lessons from COVID. I don't know if we will apply them. Four things that I've identified that we've learned is number one, that relationships matter. That when kids were not able to go to school, they weren't missing the math packets, okay? They were missing the interactions with their peers and with the adult caring adults. So we, we got to prioritize relationships. Number two, I think we learned that um, time is fungible. We often think, oh, you got to get it in these many hours, you know, the, these many credits. We have got to move away from that credit hour system. We have to be much more focused on when kids reach competency to let them move on and, you know, to the next thing. The third thing I think we learned was that um, uh, technology has got to move to the center. We have been existing in a world where technology was that thing over there. You know, you call the, the ed tech folks or the IT folks when your email don't work. I can't get my email out. Can you help me? One of the things that I think COVID taught us is they can be a part of the curriculum and leadership, whether they are helping us organizationally, academically, or administratively, they, that, that technology shouldn't be over to the side somewhere. And then the fourth thing I think we learned is that our schools have to be able to meet young people's basic needs. In most of the schools that I have been dealing with in this sort of COVID era, the first thing they did was not send out workbooks. They did not send out lessons. They sent out food. They sent out food. So those four things, I think, you know, give us a place to start. Um, I, I know it seems like, you know, an impossible task, but it really is the task that has fallen to us. Every generation has its task. And this is the one that has fallen to us. So that's what I would say is we begin to, to really make use of the lessons of COVID. One of the things that just really impressed me were those places where uh, people were real flexible with the time. I have a former student who teaches in North Carolina. He, he was holding classes at 8.30 at night. 50 some kids show up. Why? Because teenagers don't have a problem with 8.30 at night. <laughs> they have a problem with 8.30 in the morning. And yet we still won't adjust in that way. 
So I think there are some things that help us think about it. I also will tell you that right here in this area, there's the St. Louis Park District right outside of Minneapolis. One of the things that they did in their reset is they got rid of all remedial classes, all of them. They said, we have no evidence that remediation is helping anybody. So we're not doing that no more. So they moved to acceleration. And one of the things that they now do, in order to graduate from St. Louis Park, you need to have either one AP class, one honors class, or one college level class. And here's what they tell kids. Colleges teach all kinds of stuff. I don't care if you go take a dance class. That's a class at a college. The idea is that we begin to have our students feel like they belong in these spaces. Um, the funniest thing that happened to me during the pandemic, I was visiting a school in Baltimore electronically, and of course, I always ask the kids the same thing. How y'all doing with this remote learning? And I typically get, oh, I hate this, this is terrible. But this one little brother said to me, he said, oh, I love this. He said, I absolutely love it. I said, really? What do you like about it? He said, look, when they get on my nerves, I just turn this thing off. <laughs> I said, well, what happens when you do that? He said, you know, after a while they notice I'm gone, then they call me up, and, and this is what I tell them. I'm having internet connectivity <laughs> problems. I laughed just like you did, but as I thought about it, what this young man was saying was, for the first time in my life, I'm in control of my learning. See, because when he turns off face to face, that's putting the hoodie up and putting the head down. And the consequences of doing that are typically putting him out of class or maybe suspending him. So our kids actually taught us something in the midst of this. Um, so again, I think we have some places to begin. Uh, one of the things that makes me crazy is when I hear people say things like, well, you know, COVID put us all in the same boat. No, it didn't. COVID put us all in the same storm. But some of y'all went, rode the storm out on a luxury liner. You went home with your computer, put that green screen up, got your little ring light, your checks just rolling in every, every month. But others made it through the storm holding on a piece of driftwood, hair, head barely above water, do you realize that 250,000 school-aged parents died during COVID? Just rough numbers, we're talking about a half million kids who are sitting in our schools without a parent. And schools all organize around parents. Now, I've had people say to me, well, you know, the communities I live in, kids are used to people dying. You're right. You're right. They're used to people dying but never dying without ritual. Never dying and hearing people say only seven people can come to the funeral home. Only 10 people can come to the church. Only 20 people spread out around the grave. I'm going to tell y'all, you don't know this. Black people, we need a repass. <laughs> what is a repass? I have gone to many a funeral with my colleagues, and I love them. You know, they're family members, their friends, and I t told them to their face, this cookies and punch ain't going to get it. <laughs> I cannot grieve over no cookies and punch. I need a big old piece of fried chicken, some macaroni and cheese, them overcooked green beans, you know, they're gray, they're not green, candy yams, peach cobbler, I need all of that to grieve. That's part of my ritual, but it's also part of your kids' ritual, that they're used to the family coming together. You know how we tell them lies. We, we're going to stop just doing this for funerals, y'all. We're we, we going to get back together more often. Now, we, but it, that ritual, you know, the anthropologist in me is talking right now, that ritual is what holds us together. And school was difficult for young people during the pandemic because the rituals were broken. We didn't have the things that helped them make sense. I think I can probably grab one more question. Yes, ma'am.
Mm -hmm. So I think the, the first thing we did wrong is we just opened the doors and told the kids, come on back. As if they hadn't been through something and we hadn't been through something. We needed a way to get back in the place that lowered their anxiety and their depression. My um, middle son is a high school teacher in the Sacramento, California area. He's in a really good school. But he said, Mom, we're going to have more fights, more lockdowns, kids showing up with weapons. I said, because they are anxious. They are depressed. Eight, nine, 12 year olds don't know how to come up to you and say, you know, I think I need to speak with a therapist. <laughs> They're not going to do that. They're going to reach out and hit somebody who they think is looking at them sideways. So for me, it is about how we begin to start school with what uh, Chris Emden calls a radical welcoming. How do we tell kids, oh my God, I'm so glad you're here. Oh my goodness, really happy to know you are here. This is going to be a safe place. That's what I'm going to work towards. We have been so focused on just the so-called academic aspect of our work. And we know that our work is much more complicated than that, that we are serving kids, we are serving families, we are serving communities. And we have to begin to ask, what can we be doing? Another thing that I've been asking people to think about, I sit on a lot of um, nonprofit boards, United Way, Urban League, Madison Community Foundation, Madison Children's Museum. Uh, you know, if they don't pay no money, I'm on the board, right? <laughs> Coca-Cola won't call me to save my, I drink Coca-Cola. I like Coca-Cola. So I'm on all of these boards, and most of these boards have after-school programs. One of the things that I've been saying with all of them is that there is no such thing as after school. The pandemic has essentially taught us school is at any time. And so rather than waiting for kids to come to you at the end of the day, these institutions, these nonprofits, these, this programming needs to push into schools. I want to shout out the Sacramento Area Youth Speaks Group because that's exactly what they did. They went to the Sacramento area schools and they said, we have some programming. We can teach your kids how to, to write poetry. We want to come into your schools. And so those, those lines have to start being blurred, that, we don't, that school's over here and programming is over here and food insecurity is an issue over here. All of this stuff comes through our kids. And I think those are some of the things we have to be willing to do. So I think I'm at the end. Thank you again. You guys have been wonderful. Appreciate it.